Welcome to the Palestine Church audio podcast. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor James Warren. For more great content and updates from Palestine Church, please visit us at palestinechurch.com. Um, open your Bibles with me to two passages, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 3. And um, I'm going to read these verses. Actually, this is going to be a little bit uh, not my normal style here in that that uh, I normally try to stick to a, a central text, but the theme that we're going for this morning, I'm, I'm going to be incorporating a lot of verses in the Bible. And so what I'd like for us to do is read these verses together, and then we'll jump right in to the talk this morning. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, if we can put it up there, that'd be great. It says, the Lord took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Everybody say, work it. <laughs> <laughs> All these sermon titles just came to, into my mind right now. As I say, go back, go back to verse fifteen. He put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. In verse sixteen, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, "You may surely eat of every tree in the garden." And the next one, uh, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then in Colossians chapter three, in verse twenty-three, it says, "Whatever you do." Work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Amen. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you for these moments that we get to share together, that you're with us, that you are... um, engaged in this time, God, that you are not a distant God, but you are here right now in this moment moment with us, Lord. And we just, we ask you, Jesus, as we do every week, Lord, to open up our hearts and our minds to receive whatever you have for us, God. Lord, that you would take my words and take them beyond whatever I could say, Lord, and that it would it would penetrate our hearts, God, and you would transform us, God. We thank you uh, that by your blood we are transformed, God. And we just ask for that this morning uh, in this time together. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. We've been in a, uh, a few talks over the past several weeks uh, about the idea of worship. And um, I've really enjoyed it because I love studying worship and digging into this. And I hope that you're enjoying it as well. And I hope that it's, it's helping you understand what worship is, is and is really all about. And, and there's this passage in, in John uh, where Jesus is having this encounter with a Samaritan woman. And he meets this woman at the well, and there's this conversa- conversation that's going on. And the conversation is about worship. And she's, she's, she's talking to him. She's a Samaritan woman, and he is a, a Jewish man. And it, if you don't know much about that, then you... Here's some information about that. The, the Samaritans were uh, considered, um, they were half Jew. They were, they were not believed to be fully Jewish. And so uh, the Jewish people would, rejected them and would not associate with them. Matter of fact, they, they actually really hated, in this, in this period that we see that Jesus is in, they really hated their kind. And they did not want to be seen with them, didn't want to associate with them. That's why it was such a big deal when Jesus asked this woman for a drink of water. He says, she's like, why are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. And and they begin to talk about worship. And there's something that Jesus declared to this woman that was, I mean, the impact of what he was saying was so far beyond what she could have understood. And even to this day, we are, we're living in this impact of what he said. And And as they were talking about the different places that they would go to worship, Jesus said, listen, the time is coming and is here right now that no longer will you say, hey, I worship over here or I worship over there. But, but that God is, is bringing together the, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And here's, here's what happened with worship. And this is going to be a little bit difficult for us to understand. We grew, we've grown up, if you've grown up around church or even just in this East Texas area or really even in, in the States, that we have an idea of what worship is, that there are different congregations, there's different denominations, there's different religions. And at least once a week, some of them once a day, 
gather together for worship, right? Well, in this context, imagine that times 10. <laughs> being a, a Jew or even being a Samaritan, that, that the requirements for those to worship were to come multiple times a day to the temple, to a specific place at a specific time to worship God. And what Jesus is declaring to this woman is, is something so profound that the days of worship being contained to an event, a time and a location, those days are over because now that Jesus has come, he is, for lack of a better phrase, let God out of the, out of the temple <laughs> and he's gone into all the world and now into our hearts. And so really there's this shift that's happening with the idea of worship. Worship has gone from an event to really an essence. And so to understand biblical worship, to understand Christian worship, is to understand that worship begins and lives inside of our hearts. It's a posture that our hearts take towards God. Now, we still have events. We still have worship experiences and services where we come together. And I hope to later in in these talks actually um, come back back to corporate worship. And and I will tell you the values that we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament concerning corporate worship. But I feel that in in these talks, I want to start by deconstructing the idea that worship only occurs during events. And in a very event-driven society, I think it's important if we're going to grasp the understanding of what worship is to God, that we need to understand that it's not an event anymore. It's an essence that, that at any moment in our lives, we can change the posture of our hearts to begin to worship God. And we don't have to go to a certain place to begin to worship Him. Think of how liberating that would be. Going to church, let's just call it church, so many times a week, and, tr- and, and, and maybe your heart was right to, to try to worship God, give him worship and adoration that was pleasing to him, and then a man comes and says, those days are over. I think I would be set free to say, man, wow, are you telling me that the time is coming and it is right now that I can just worship God in spirit and in truth wherever I am? And he's saying, yes. I am the fulfillment of that. That was Jesus' proclamation to this woman. And over the past two talks that we had, we looked looked in the New Testament. We were were zoned in on this this woman named Mary. Almost every time that we see Mary, she's at the feet of Jesus. And she really models this, this New Testament worship that we see where she lives in, you know, adoration of who Jesus was, that she saw him and she was absolutely in awe of who he was. And she was there in the house, as we spoke last week, just just listening to him, just looking at him and just hearing his teachings. Several weeks ago when we looked at her, she had she had taken this expensive ointment and, and poured it on Jesus, which was a, this extravagant act of love that she did. But all I mean, I, I, we started with this definition that worship occurs when we, are, we live in awe of God. Everybody say awe. Awe. Now say, say it like you saw a cute baby. It's a different type of awe. Okay, but this is, but there is some awe to that. But, but when, we, when we see God for who he is, when Mary saw Jesus for who he was, she was in awe of who he was. And, and then out of that, that awe came an expression of her worship. And the thing about awe, this word that we see in the Bible is used in the Old Testament actually would be the word uh, that you would see either used as reverence or fear. Uh, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That word would be the same word that we would would derive the words, it would be uh, translated, you could say, in reverence. Those who are in reverence of God, those who are in awe of who God is. And so what I'd like to even start this talk off thinking like this way. Okay, awe is not just an emotional feeling. Because awe, depending on the size and the beauty and the magnificence of what we are in awe of, might demand something more than just an emotional response to what we see. 
And so God, being that absolute perfect, perfect truth, would, yes, maybe elicit a response from us that just uh, uh, awe, but also seeing the truth of who he is and his nature and his character would also elicit a response of devotion to him. Because I don't want you to think that, that worship is, is just an emotional response. Because sometimes we think, you know, I mean, we do this in the church culture. Let's just be honest. You know, we see somebody who's very expressive in their worship and we go, ha, you're a worshiper. You've got the heart of a worshiper. Just the way you worship, just, mm, it inspires me to worship. And I get what we're saying, but we're all worshipers. Every one of us. And yes, there's different expressions. And I love when worship is expressed through that instrument right there and all of these instruments, but especially when Kim just starts playing, I'm like, ah, Father, there must be cellos in heaven. <laughs> and, and, our, and our team just, I mean, the expression is just, ah, yes, heavenly. Yes, and we'll, we'll come back to that because there is a value for for instruments. You see it throughout the New Testament all the way into the future when we're in heaven. There's instruments, there's music, there's, there's celebration going on, and it's a great privilege for us to be a part of a corporate worship service, but you're all worshipers. The time has come, as Jesus said, and is here right in front of you when you can now worship God freely. So, Seeing God elicits a response from us of, of expression that results in extravagant love and devotion to him. I love this definition of worship that I found. In an old, this is an old Webster's uh, definition, which is great. It says, worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. With extravagant love and extreme submission. Submission, that true worship, in other words, happens as we place God in his, his rightful place in our hearts and our minds as the most valuable, the highest priority in our lives. And when we live out of that place, we live a life of worship. This morning, I want to um, speak to you from uh, this title here, When Your Work Becomes Worship. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. When your work becomes worship. Did you know that uh, most all of Jesus' parables were, um, had a workplace context? Did you notice in the book of Acts that out of the, the 40 miracles that were performed in Acts, 39 of them happened outside of the church? Did you know that what we do here is amazing? And God cares, absolutely cares about what's going on here. But did you know that God cares about every other part of your life? Did you know that God absolutely cares about your work? You say, what? Work? That's a four-letter word. How can we talk about that in church? Well, I want to... um, I want to examine some things about our work. If we're going to be worshipers and we're going to live a lifestyle of worship that will help us understand what it means to become worshipers and what it means for our work to actually become worship. Um, In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the verse that we read in the beginning, we see that God purpose us to work. Here's one of the four things that you need to understand uh, for your work to become worship is that, number one, it's God's purpose. It's God's purpose for you to work. In Genesis chapter 2, 15, he says that he put them in the garden and he told them to work the ground and to keep it. And I want to make everybody aware just so we're on the same page. This is before the curse, 
This is before the fall of man. This is in a perfect world. This is in a world where man and God are in perfect communion together and in love with each other. And God put Adam and Eve there. He put mankind there so that they could work. And this word means to prepare and to develop. To prepare and to develop. And and, and the picture here is like a gardener. That God has placed each one of us in some place and given us the ability, the capacity to do work. And he has given us the raw materials, but he wants us to cultivate and to grow those things that he's entrusted us with. Now, we, for the most part, we understand our society, our society really encourages, sometimes pushes people to work. Uh, it is frowned upon, if you are frowned upon if you do not work in this culture. Now, there are other cultures where uh, nobody works. Um, like, maybe their economies aren't as developed as ours, and maybe um, people, or maybe, um, excuse me, maybe their economies are so much more developed than ours. There's some sarcasm in this, okay? Just hold, hold tight. That uh, there is no requirement for people to work. But for the most part, across the world, 99% of all of the world is working. And, you know, we talk about how wonderful God is and how much, and how involved he is in our life. And, you know, most, of, most, most everybody here spends about almost 40 hours a week at work. Some of you longer. Some of you a lot longer. Uh, 60, 65 hours a week working. And I just wonder, like, what would it be like if God cares, if God cared so much about our work? What, would anything change about our work if God was involved in it, what happens is the tendency is, is we get saved, we, we, we get filled with Jesus, we're, we're so full of his spirit, we're, we're in love with him. And, and many times, just because of the model that we live in, it's like we, we, we get busy with church work because we think that's where all things spiritual happen, at church. And I'm here to tell you that what Jesus declared to the woman, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 is true to this day. That worship happens everywhere. And worship is a posture of your heart. And that you do not have to just come here to worship Jesus. That you can worship him any moment of any day, in your work, working with your family, loving your kids. That there's an opportunity for you to worship him freely. This is really good news. And God cares about your work. Because he created us to work. And he put, he put Adam there to develop and to cultivate this place for the glory of God and for the benefit of humans. And he made us in his image. And we see that there's like 12 times that we see already in, in just Genesis 1 and 2 that God is creating something. And so God created us in his image unlike any other the, of the other species any of the other things that he created. And so we actually have this God-given nature to create things. And he, ex- he wanted us to be there co-creating with him. And here's the, here's the key, and here's the idea, that God would be creating through us. God would be creating with us and through us so that, so that his kingdom would be established here on earth. God absolutely cares about your work. 500 years ago, uh, the reformer Martin Luther, I love this, the, he had this question. He was asking God, he said, God, what exactly does do these, uh, what, excuse me, how exactly does God do these things? He was reading in Psalms 147, verse 13, it says, for he strength, strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. And Martin Luther said, how exactly do you do that, God? And I love what he wrote. He said, how does does he strengthen the bars of our city? Well, by city planners and architects, by, by politicians who pass good laws to protect the city. And how does he bless our children that are within our midst? 
He said through the work of teachers and, and pediatricians. He says, how does, how does he make peace in our borders? He says, by means of good lawyers and, and policemen. He says, how does he, how does he fill us with the finest of wheat by farmers and factory workers and restaurant owners? Our profession, our professions, L- Luther said, are like the masks that God wears in caring for our world. He said, when we pray the Lord's prayer, we ask God, give us this day our daily bread. And he does give us our daily bread. And he does it by the means of a farmer who planted and harvested the grain and the baker who made the flour into bread and the person who prepared it for a meal. What's the point? The point is that that God uses us to create through us and with him to even provide the daily bread sometimes. To, he, he uses us a part of his creation and he creates with us and through us. And this is all done through work. This was meant to be a glorious thing in which we would enter into this place of divine satisfaction with God. That we would understand that he created us to create that he created you uh, to work through you, he, to work his purposes through you, that his kingdom would be created and established through you, that the things on, in heaven would be built here on earth through your work and my work. Now, you don't have to be a Christian to tap into this uh, divine satisfaction. Some people, when they step into the thing that they're working, that, that is, is what they just feel absolutely in love with, and they feel like, man, whether they would admit that there's a creator or not, they say, man, I was made for this. I mean, there's some people, they, just, they, they have a job, they have a task, they have a business that they own, and it's just, it's like, man, I love doing this. I am consumed with this. It's like I find my greatest pleasure in doing this. You guys remember the movie uh, Chariots of Fire, right? The, the guy's running. And it, I think I wrote the quote down here. He says, oh yeah, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. There's something about that that God created. You know, it's, it's hard in our little religious minds because we want everybody to just be either a preacher or a worshiper or a server or something. It's like, well, I don't know. Where, where, where did you fit in that? Because we think that on, the only place that worship can happen is at the events. We're missing the essence of worship because there's something about when somebody finds their purpose and their passion and their calling and they just walk in it. Whether they even know God yet, they, they, they feel so satisfied in their soul because this is what I was made to do. And God uses those, even those, those times when we didn't even know him to, to lead us to him. And God wants you to walk. He wants you to walk in that place where you find your calling, your place, where your work is worship. But you guys know that sin entered into the equation. There was one of the the, the curses that, that was on the land was this, is that your work would become toilsome. That he cursed the ground and, and there's thorns and thistles that would frustrate our efforts. And I love it. One theologian said, at this point, work became a compulsionary act of survival. What was meant to be something that we enjoy became something that was necessary for us to survive. And some of you are having a hard time with me even talking about work because all you're thinking about is surviving. You're like, you're talking about work and like it's enjoyable, but I'm just surviving here. And I want you to know that that comes from the curse that was put on the land. That we work and we sweat and we labor with zero satisfaction sometimes. And you may be here this morning and you say, well, you know, James, I feel partly satisfied in my job. And that's wonderful. That sometimes there's moments of fulfillment. There's moments where you say, God, this feels like you. And then there's moments when you don't. And then you may be here this morning. You say, James, uh, I absolutely hate my job. As you're talking about this, it's reminding me how much I hate my job, how much I hate my boss. And and I want to talk to you this morning about that. God knows where our hearts are when it pertains to work. God knows the struggles that we have. God knows the areas where we uh, need his help. But we must understand 
in order to live a lifestyle of worship and for this, this great privilege for our work to become our worship, we need to realize first off that it is God's purpose for us to work and that we can find heavenly satisfaction in our work. And we, when we have our heart postured towards God to say, God, this is for you, our work becomes worship. Whether you like your boss or not, whether you like your job or not, if your heart is positioned in the right way, everything that your hand touches becomes worship to God. The second thing we need to understand is excellence. Excellence. Everybody say excellence. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. We read it. It says, whatever you do, work heartily. We, in these texts, is, well, I won't say the saying we'd say for that, but... Um, <laughs> As for the Lord and not for men. As for the Lord and not for men. Um, A spirit of excellence is the uh, solution for poverty. Excellence will drive out poverty thinking in your mind. It will actually drive out poverty in your job and in your position, wherever you're working. That excellence actually is something very powerful. Because excellence subscribes to a greater idea than your boss. It subscribes to a greater boss than your earthly boss. <laughs> the idea of excellence comes from this, is that I'm not working for man, I'm working for God. And so therefore, the standard, even if the standard of the company is really high, it's probably below the standard of my heavenly father. And so subscribing to the highest standard known would be excellence, a spirit of excellence. And God has intended for each one of us to walk with a spirit of excellence. My God, listen, our town is poverty stricken. And, and there, believers need to rise up in this season with a spirit of excellence understanding their purpose and what God has created them to do. And, and, and we must uphold that standard. And we do it with grace and with love. But understanding that, that we are submitted not to the, the standards of man, but the standard of God. And when we understand this, excellence is no longer uh, an external thing that's put on us. The spirit of excellence lives within us. And it means that we look at things differently. We approach things differently. It means that we hold ourselves to a standard maybe higher than those around us are holding us to. There's this great quote by C.S. Lewis. He once noted, he said, uh, how many valleys in the world are absolutely undiscovered by human eyes but are still filled with beautiful flowers? Here was his question. He said, for whom did God create that beauty? if no human eyes would ever see it. And Lewis answered this. He said uh, that God does some things only for his own pleasure, that he sees even when no one else does. God has created you to create beautiful things and to subscribe to the standard of excellence, to, to God's excellence, is to subscribe to this idea that it doesn't matter who sees it. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for God. There's something about that. Imagine if you worked in your environment and they say, hey, we want you to do this. We got a task for you. You know, there's all these corners you can cut. There's all these things you can do to get the job done. There's all these relationships you could violate to get the job done. And guess what? Maybe, maybe your boss is pleased with it. Maybe he's not. Maybe, maybe you get that promotion. Maybe you don't. But God sees all things and he knows where your heart was and what you did when no one was looking And so to say yes to this idea of excellence, to say yes to, to, I'm not doing this for man, I am doing this for God, is to actually position us in a place where our work can become worship to him. Number three, you got purpose, you got excellence, you have integrity. Proverbs 11, verse one. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Integrity. It's a word we don't hear much anymore. We don't hear people talk about 
integrity, what you do, how you are, how you live when no one else is looking. You know, I think sometimes we get confused in, the, in, this, in this idea of worship in our work. And uh, this is an East Texas thing. You'll see so many businesses that, and I'm not knocking any businesses, but they'll, they'll name, you know, if you're cutting hair, it'd be like Kingdom Cuts or something like that, you know. Like, because we put a Christian name in it, it's going to be Kingdom Business, right? Um, I'm not going to say any more. I'm, I'm getting nervous right now, like somebody owns a kingdom business here. I'm not, that's not my point. My point is this, is that it doesn't matter what name you put on your business. Yeah. What matters is, is how you live out your life and how you execute your business. And people could care less if there's a Christian name on top of your business, if you don't walk out those principles and if you don't subscribe to a standard of excellence and have integrity, your word is not your bond and all this stuff. If you don't have all that, People could care less. And the problem is, maybe maybe some of us here have been, you know, done wrong by some businesses that had uh, the the cross on there, (laughs) all this stuff. And we have to work through that. I'm thinking of a story that I wrote down. I really don't know if I should share, but we had years ago, this is not a business in our town or nobody that you would know. Years ago in our business, we had somebody who had one of those businesses that had the cross and and the, the great name and everything. And this person, we did a job for them, and they wouldn't pay us. And we called them and, you know, did the biblical way of just grace and integrity on our part and, and just wouldn't pay the bill. And it's like, what are you supposed to think of that? Are you supposed to just say, okay, well, that's, that's just the way Christians are? Well, let me tell you something. That's the way most of the world thinks about Christian businesses. They do. They think. And it only takes one business to wrong them. And they say, yeah, this must be all, all the Christians' businesses must be this way. They use that to get customers, but not to have integrity. How about this? Tips on Sunday. You know, the reputation of churchgoers is that Sunday after, uh, you know, after service is out, we flood the restaurants and we're the lowest tipping crowd of the week. You guys tell me. (laughs) Does that reflect the nature of our God? (laughs) We're in here giving our tithes and blessing folks and raising our hands and we go to the restaurants and we're cursing people. (laughs) It's an issue of integrity. the, The God in here we worship is not the same God that we worship out there because God's more interested in in the worship events and not the essence of worship. But when you walk in that integrity... When you walk uh, in this God-given integrity, when you subscribe to this standard of excellence, when you understand that working is your purpose, these things, this work that we do, becomes worship to Him. Number four. This is the last one. Service to others. Second Corinthians. 8 verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You know, Jesus' model, Jesus' idea of changing the world, Jesus' idea of being the greatest leader was this. I did not come to to be served, but to serve. What would happen in your job and the things that your hands finds to do, finds to do if, if people became a, a huge priority in your life and in your work? Do you, do you work for the benefit of other people? Do you work for the, we've already established that we should be working for God, but do you work to bless other people or do you work to bless yourself? See, when we when we begin to adopt this idea that we want to be like Jesus and we want to serve others, we want to lay down our lives so that others can be blessed, so that others can succeed, so that others can go further than what we did, we are actually walking in our, our, our God nature right there. And when our heart is postured like that, guess what? Your work becomes worship. When you have integrity, when you're doing the right thing, when no one else is looking, guess what? Your work just became worship. 
When you're subscribing to a standard of excellence, whether anyone sees it or not, but just for the sake of God himself, your work is becoming worship. When you realize that God has called you and positioned you and he has a great destiny on your life and you are finding that place where your hands are creating and co-creating with God, guess what? Your work becomes worship. Now, I want to put out a warning for you um, because all we're talking about is work. Don't let your worship, I'm sorry, don't worship your work. Let your work become worship, but don't worship your work. Are you confused? When Adam and Eve fell, our relationship with work changed. As we mentioned earlier, it transitioned from this, this, this divine satisfaction to now a compulsionary pursuit of survival. And one of the things that we see in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 4, even with the, the story of uh, Cain and Abel, we see this relationship in, in how it's affecting the descendants of Adam and Eve. And Cain, this is the one who killed Abel, was driven out into the wilderness. And later, when we see uh, his, his descendants describe, described, it, it, would, it would say like this, his, it would say his descendants who were known for agriculture are those who uh, did music and metal, metal and they were, they were great It's not saying that they weren't great workers. It's saying that that was what they were known for. Now, if you see Seth, Seth, who was uh, the next son that was born of of Adam, and his descendants were described this way. They were defined as those who began to call upon the name of the Lord in Genesis 4, verse 25. I want you to see two different things that happen. With, with one, work became their identity. What they made was what they were known for. And with another, Seth, who represents this, this godly lineage, he was known for what? Those who called upon the Lord. And in a society where the second question that we ask after we ask your name, what do you do? We're all... Our identity is so closely tied to our work. I must remind you that you cannot worship your work, but you can make your work into worship. And all of that comes back to having a posture in our hearts, a posture of worship which says, God, you are the most valuable thing in my life, you are the number one priority. Your word matters more than anything. And then when our heart is in that place, everything that our hand touches becomes worship. Every work that we do is worship when our heart is postured to live in awe of him. Don't worship your work. Work is a terrible God. It's the worst God that you will ever have in your life. God is a really good God. Let me finish with this. When we make Jesus, when we keep Jesus, the most important thing in life, we will live a life of worship. It's not, it's not hard. If we keep him, we're in his rightful place, enthroned on our hearts, just at the, at the highest seat of our hearts and in our minds and in our words and in our deeds and actions, that, that our life will be worship to him. And the Bible says this, that, that our worship is like a sweet aroma, an incense that goes up to heaven. And when God is in that place in our hearts, He's pleased, and God can't help but draw near to the worship of your life. 
I don't want you to think that worship is just an event. Jesus paid a really high price to not make worship just an event. It's, it's here. It's an essence. It's in your heart. And I don't want you to think that your work is absolutely unspiritual. That your business, that your teaching, that your family life is unspiritual. No, Jesus paid a great price so that every area of your life, you are absolutely free to worship him. To be in awe of him. That in every season, in every moment of life, you can find him. You can see him. And you can be in awe of him. Why don't you stand this morning?